Hi everyone and welcome to episode one of my new series, Canadian Case Study, where I go through Canadians' personal finance situation, whether it be helping them plan for retirement, get out of debt, manage their expenses, or even this episode, which, which will be a Canadian success story. I had him send two months of his bank statement and his credit card statement, just so I could see his income and help uh, just look through some of his expenses on his credit card, see if he's paying too much interest or if he's spending too much on restaurants, which I think he is. If you're interested in being on the podcast, just send me an email. I'll leave my email in the description. We can do Zoom if you're not in Toronto or if you want to do in person, it'll be all the better. Don't mind my studio right now. You'll be seeing images of me in my kitchen. Uh, you'll be seeing uh, the guests sitting in my living room. I had three podcast studios cancel on me and I also had three Canadians cancel on me last minute last week when I had the podcast studio booked. So hoping to get that a little set up, maybe I'll get a few episodes banked in a row so I won't have to go two, three weeks without the video on the channel. I also had one Canadian, we filmed the episode, she reviewed it, she didn't like it, so I had to scrap it. Hoping to get that all sorted out before I get started. So make sure to like and subscribe to the channel and let's get into the video. Cool, all right, tell me your name and what do you do for work? Name is Sam, uh, I am in IT. I work two jobs actually, so I'm an IT director for my day job and then I have my own business which is IT consulting. Okay, how much do you make per month if you don't mind me asking? Uh, yes, so day job I make around, are we talking before taxes or after taxes? Before taxes. Before taxes, so I make around 8,000 per month before taxes, uh, sorry 9,000 per month before taxes for my day job and on average I make about 10,000 a month for my side business. That's insane, so you could potentially be making 18,000, 19,000 a month? Correct, yes. That's awesome. Okay, can you describe the side business? Yeah, so essentially we provide IT services uh, to small and medium sized businesses, uh, consulting, disaster recovery, backup solutions, and just the standard managed services. So we're talking about, you know, remote support, on site support, things of that nature. That's awesome. So, like, I don't really understand. How did you get it started? So, your main job was IT, and then you decided you're doing the same thing, but on your own on the side? Yes, essentially. So I started as a, as a junior system admin uh, back in 2016. So about seven years ago. Um, and long story short, I was in the right place, right time. I ended up getting promoted to an IT manager, did that for a few years, uh, jumped ship to another company as an IT manager, did that for about another year. And then I went back to my existing company. I was promoted as an IT director and working at two companies that are just extremely uh, technically oriented, if that makes sense, you kind of pick up the good and bad in terms of how a company should be run from that aspect. So I decided to, you know, put my foot forward and try to start my own company. That's awesome. And how old are you? 29. 29. Okay. And making like 18, 19,000 a month. Roughly speaking. Yeah. Okay. That's and how long have you been doing both of these? Uh, so I've been doing my corporate job for about seven years now, coming up on seven years, and my own business I started in 2020. But we really only picked up traction. Uh, so when I say we, I mean my business partner and I, we're 50-50 in the company. Uh, we only picked up traction uh, late last year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is rel relatively new. So you don't have. So do you mind me asking if are you do you own or do you rent right now? Uh, for my uh, residence, you mean? Yes. Uh, so right now I rent. Okay. How much do you pay a month? Uh, so I live with a couple of my friends. Uh, we split the rent. The rent's 4500 a month and my share comes up to 900 a month, excluding utilities and all of the other stuff. Okay, so super high income and low monthly. <laughs> Correct, yes. Okay, that's great. And then, so 40, you pro it's probably a big house then. It is, yes. It's, uh, I think, a 5,000 square foot house. Very big house. Well, okay. there, there's four of us, right? So... Okay, so it's like a frat house? Essentially, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. And then, do you have any student debt? No. All paid off? All paid off. Okay, did you study IT in university then? I went to York for computer science, and then I took programming analysis at um, Seneca College. Okay. So, re relatable to an extent. Okay, and then what about cars? Do you have... You drove here, okay. And then, can you talk about your car debt? Uh, yeah, car situation, highly regrettable. Um, so, I... I Currently drive a Mustang GT 5.0. Uh, the first regret is it's a gas guzzler. Um, it doesn't work in the winter, which obviously with the nature of my business, I need a car that works in the winter. Uh, so I was forced to then purchase another car. So I have a Subaru as my winter car. So two cars. Correct. Okay. And you're the sole driver on both. That is correct. Yes. Okay. So I did notice on your credit card statement that it is a gas guzzler. So uh, it looks like it looks like 400 a month. 
uh, on yeah, I would say so on the on the average side, correct. That's crazy. Okay, so then what's the car payment on both? Um, so all in, excluding gas with insurance, I'm looking at around fifteen hundred a month. Okay, that's a lot. So you pay more for cars than you do on rent. Correct. It's fine. So you do like the cars. I get it. I spend a lot as well. But high income, it's fine. You have certain areas to spend. Let's talk about your savings or investings. Do you have any? Sure. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I have a standard TFSA account, um, and then I also have a cash account, and I have a generic high interest savings account. Okay. How much on each? Uh, the high interest savings account, I have about uh, eighty thousand sitting in there. Uh, for the TFSA, it's maxed out. Um, I, I believe it's market value it's sitting at around 90,000 and my initial investment was about 80,000. Uh, and then my cash investment account, I have about $10,000 in there. You have 80,000 in a interest account? Correct. Why? Uh, saving up for a real estate fund. Wow, okay, 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 that's awesome. And then TFSA, do you have RSP then? No, I don't have RSP. <clears throat> Why not? Um, if you want the transparent answer, I don't like the idea of retiring at the age of 60 or 65. Um, from my understanding, and I'm not well versed when it comes to RSPs, but I do believe that you can't actually pull out your, your RSP until a certain age threshold. Um, and just based off that knowledge, I, I don't like the idea of, of having my money tied up in an account that I can't necessarily see for the, until I hit 60, which is 30, 30 odd years from now, if that makes sense. Okay, but you can, so you can withdraw whenever, it's just like a tax penalty. Correct, correct, yeah. Um, so in, in, in that regard, I, I would rather just put it in a GIC of some sort, or I would rather just bolster my investments. Um, I, I'm a little more on the risk averse side, so I'd, I'd rather just uh, invest whether it comes to specific stocks or put it in a GIC, like I said, and, and I feel like I have more flexibility when I control the money in that sense versus just locking it up in an RRSP. Okay, so I, I get it. Um, you can still invest in stocks in an RSP. So like when you initially deposit an RSP, you get a tax benefit. So you okay. get like a tax deduction. So if you put 80,000 into an RSP, you might get 30,000 back. And then you can use that to put in a GIC to invest. But you're right, when you pull out, if you put in 80,000 in RSP, if you pull it out, you get taxed on it. Because initially you got 30,000, you have to pay that 30,000 back. Mm -hmm. So it still might help you, but if you're using that 80K for a real estate fund, then I wouldn't recommend investing it, I guess. But there are certain things like a first time home buyer's account, mm -hmm. first home savings account that I recently made a video on. And then there's also like a first time home buyer's plan that you can withdraw like up to 35,000. So you can, you can potentially put that entire amount in and withdraw for a home if you want. Okay, that's information I didn't know. Okay, fair yeah, enough. if you, if you watch my video. Fair enough, fair enough. All right, now I do want to go into um, pretty much the, the crux of this video is like a rags to riches or maybe, maybe just like a success story. You spent a lot on cars because we know each other for a while, so I'm asking you questions and answers sure. I already know the answer to. I'm asking you questions I already know the answer to, but let's talk about your initial credit issues 10 years ago, um, how you got there and how you fixed it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, when I was younger, I loved uh, vehicles. I loved motorcycles. I loved cars. Uh, so I would take out loans or I would use money that I didn't necessarily have to put towards vehicles in this case. Uh, I made some bad financial decisions. Uh, I was approved for an OSAP loan, uh, which is quite typical when, when it comes to being a student. And I used majority of that money to purchase a vehicle at the time and uh, any remainder money that I had or I worked for. Um, I, I, I used that to purchase another vehicle. I had a car and a motorcycle back when I was 18. Um, and, and essentially what happened is uh, I, I missed out on payments towards my student loan. Uh, and that essentially catapulted me to automatically hitting collections. I was getting a lot of collection calls and I don't know how many people are, are used to collections, but a, a lot of people, um, they don't know about it to an extent, right? So when you get these calls, you automatically assume it's a scam call or a spam call or whatever the case. And because of that, my um, interest payments towards my collection accounts started increasing. Um, and I never made payments towards them for about three or four years. So I became extremely insolvent in that aspect where I had uh, my entire student loan uh, essentially hitting the collections. Uh, and then I had a couple of visas that I got approved for as well. I was with TD Bank to begin with. 
they approved me for a visa, thousand dollars. I didn't understand what the concept of a visa was. I went on a shopping spree and I never paid back a dime, right? So that was another account that ended up hitting my collections. Uh, and then I got approved for another visa as well, a Canadian tire, same story. I think it was a $700 limit visa. Uh, I used all of it and I never made a payment towards it. Uh, so long story short, by the time I was 24, I had about $15,000 in debt between my three accounts, which is the student loan, um, which is the TD visa and the Canadian tire visa as well. Um, and at that point, my credit was sub 550, if I remember correctly. That's insane. So like, so what did you think a credit card was? <laughs> At the time, I mean, I thought it was free money, which is obviously not the case, right? Um, that's the long and short of it. I was just extremely irresponsible when it came to money. Uh, I didn't understand, as, as cliche as it sounds, I didn't understand the value of the dollar, right? Um, I mean, you put both of those together in addition to, you know, the age factor, like I was young at the time and I was interested in things that no longer interest me like like vehicles as an example um and just bad decisions yeah. just bad financial decisions so you ended up with you had three cars total so you had like a bike you had a, a nissan 370 at one point and then what else so i had a motorcycle when i was 18 um I, I had a lot of sports cars at the time when i was 18 i believe i had a civic si at the time um, and then some of the money that I had from, from OSAP at the time, I went and I put it towards, uh, I believe it was the FRS at the time. So another sports car, I jumped ship, uh, in which my monthly payments were even larger, right? Um, the, the moral of the story is the good news is I never actually defaulted on any of my car payments, which is a, a good sign. But um, my student loan was, was a killer in a sense. I mean, I owed so much money and, and interest was piling up on it. Right. In addition to my visas at the time as well. So you use the OSAP for your instead of tuition, you used it for a car. Yes. Nice. OK. And then you kept rolling one car into a bigger debt for another. Exactly. Yeah. So it was like a chain effect where I went from one relatively expensive car to another more expensive car and then to another more expensive car. And I mean, here I am with an extremely expensive car. So it was like a chain event in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so you were under 550 for credit and then what happened? How did you change? How did you come around? Um, well, if I'm being transparent, I had a conversation with you, right? And, and you educated me on the importance of credit and how it's extremely important. Uh, it's, it's the sole factor for you to get approved for loans, to start a business or eventually to, you know, purchase real estate property or whatever the case. Um, so you actually, uh, educated me to the point where I looked into a secured MasterCard because that was the only way I was going to get, uh, a credit card so I could bolster my credit. Uh, so I found one of the, I, I think it's one of the most famous credit card companies, Capital One. Um, and they offer hundred percent, um, guaranteed secured MasterCards. And what a secured MasterCard was essentially you front the money and they put it towards your account. So there's no risk on their end. But the flip side is, and the benefit is, you're building your credit through that credit card. So that was the the starting point of me essentially taking my credit from 550 to whatever it is now. Do you know what it is now? Uh, yes, it is, I believe, 820. That's awesome. And how long did it take you to get there? So when I was 550 and I got my secured MasterCard, I think I put only $300. So I, I was approved essentially for a secured MasterCard with a limit of 300. Um, it took me less than eight months to get my credit to a respectable level where my existing bank, uh, which is CIBC still, they approved me for a $5,000 credit card only after eight months. That's crazy. And like, remember how, do, do you remember like the feeling of despair or how upset or not depressed, but you felt like there was no way out? It, yeah, I mean... I spent a lot of time on Google. Like once I started educating myself on how important credit is in general, I spent a lot of time on Google and just reading a lot of uh, people's opinions and just their stories in regards to how credit impacted them. And I read stories of, of people in, in, in their 30s and their 40s, even in their 50s, where they can't get approved for a loan. They can't um, put any money towards a mortgage. They can't finance a car or lease a car. And, and these were all attributes that led me to I wouldn't say fear, but as close to it as possible, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, because one, one of the things that I aspire for, and I'm sure a lot of people do is financial stability. And I feel like credit score and financial stability are just one and the same. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially just 
reading other people's stories, it kind of, you know, reinvigorated me to put a lot of focus towards fixing my credit because it's extremely important. The last thing I want to do is, is put money towards a house and the only reason I get declined is because my credit is poor. Yeah. And then were you surprised at how fast it took to fix? I was extremely surprised. Um, I was very, very, very surprised. I was actually uh, subscribed to Equifax, which is a Canadian version for just like credit monitoring in a sense. Um, and I got an email notification saying uh, your credit jumped up by 150 points or something along those lines. And I thought to myself, there's no way I've only used a secured MasterCard with a $300 limit for less than a year, right? Um, and from what I remember, I was, I think, at 540 or 530 points. Um, and I jumped up to, I think, 690 or 700. And that was good enough for me to take it to CIBC, where they saw that credit rating. And they essentially approved me on spot for a $5,000 limit visa. That's awesome. So we got through your income. I know I'm going through this kind of fast. I don't have any structure yet. I'm just figuring this out. So we got through your income, your job, education, going from bad credit to good credit. Now I want to go, I think I created a monster because I have your credit card statements here. It looks like I have April, no, I have May and June. So you just got a $7,000 increase in your credit. You went from 22,000 to 29,000, mm -hmm. which is great. But then looking at how much you spent, <laughs> so in, in June, you spent $8,800 and you had 99 transactions on your credit card. Do you like, I like, you didn't pay any interest on it. So I checked the last two months, you didn't pay any interest, but, um, did you know you use your credit card this much? I mean, uh, first and foremost, I had no idea I had 99 transactions. Um, yeah. I'm actually very diligent when it comes to the money I spend out of my credit card. Mm -hmm. I have a rule of thumb where um, whatever I spend on my credit card has to get paid off within the month. And this is, again, to avoid any interest payments. Um, uh, so when it comes to that rule of thumb, I'm essentially a little more lenient in regards to how much I spend on my visa. Um, I, I am. I would classify myself as a reckless spender. If I get a thought that I want to buy something, I'll essentially go and buy it without putting much thought into it, which is not the right way, in my opinion. Um, to answer your question, no, I had no idea. I had 99 transactions. Uh, I do know I spent a lot of money in, in one of those months, and I do know that I paid it off all in full. Um, that's one recommendation I have to anyone who's watching this video. If you want to build your credit, I highly recommend building a structure where whatever you spend on your visa, you make sure you pay it off in full within, you know, the month statement to avoid any interest. Payments. Yeah. If you don't have the cash, obviously don't spend it, but I do want to go into some of your spending. Sure. Habits. So I don't <laughs> just looking at June, uh, $1,300 in restaurants. Mm -hmm. So what I like about CIBC is that they summarize it at the very end. So that's where I got the 99 transactions from. So $1,300 in restaurants. I'm, I'm guessing this is like going out on dates as well. Yes. Uh, my girlfriend and I are, relatively big eaters. Um, we like to indulge in, in, in the fine, fine aspects of foods, uh, different restaurants, uh, fast foods, late nights, uh, binging. Right. But nature. like looking at, so it also gives a year to date. So for the first six months of the year, uh, $5,600. So almost, let's say if you annualize that, it'll be like $11,000 just on restaurants. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a lot. I agree hundred percent. So at your income level, cause you're at like the 50% tax bracket, you'll have to earn $22,000 pay tax to have $11,000 for the restaurants. Do you cook or get groceries at all? Um, transparently speaking, no. Uh, so the fact that I'm working essentially two jobs right now, uh, my time is extremely tied up and, and uh, I know that's not an excuse, but the fact of the matter is I only have X amount of hours free per day. And I like to dedicate that to, you know, spare time hobbies like the gym and whatnot. Um, I'm also not a good cook. Um, so when it comes to cooking or preparing meals for myself or anything of that nature, I take the uh, coward way out and I just buy myself food, which is not ideal. Um, I didn't actually know how much I spent on, on restaurants in that month or year to date specifically. Um, but I'm not shocked by that number, to be honest. Yeah, that is that is pretty crazy. And it's like, I also see how much you spend on transportation. So the gas is a lot. It looks like $100 every time you fill up and it's like four times a month. That sounds about accurate, yeah. That's nuts. Yeah. Okay, and then looking at a few other things, it looks like you spent a lot starting a business or starting your business. So I see owner minute book, which is like 600 bucks. What is that? 
So that's uh, another business venture that I started with one of my coworkers. Uh, we just used owner to essentially start a corporation together. Okay, and then that's also with Payoneer because that's another 600 bucks a month. Uh, so that's, uh, in relation to that, we hired a freelancer um, and uh, one of the international payment methods is Payoneer. Okay, so part of the 8,800 you spent this month, a lot of it, okay, not a lot of it. I see some vacation travel here. A lot of it does seem like starting a business. Like I see freelancer as well. Freelancer.com as part of the business? Yes, correct. So freelancer.com is, is uh, it's essentially a platform where you can hire freelancers. Mm -hmm. um, and these freelancers, majority of them are, are actually based in the Middle East. Um, so you can get high quality work for, I would say, a cheaper rate, in a sense, compared to Canadian or US freelancers. Okay, and then Canada Computers, $2,000. Uh, that is a present for the girlfriend. Oh my God. What is it? Computer. Yeah, but I know, but like... Oh, so like uh, I bought her a gaming computer, I bought her two monitors, um, I bought her a headset, a gaming mouse, but a gaming why? keyboard. She, she games? She games, yeah. She games. She recently got into gaming, actually. Um, and uh, she would game off her laptop, which is an extremely old school Lenovo notebook. And uh, she never had the experience of, you know, playing games or working off of a dual monitor setup as an example. So I wanted to kind of... Fulfill her dreams, if that makes sense. Okay, I get it. That is a lot on a gaming computer. And then, okay, I'm not as angry as about that as I am at Tim Hortons. So I see it <laughs> I see sometimes three times a day. Yeah. Okay. That's nuts. And then I see I see you gamble a lot. I do. Um, I would say it's... Uh, so I, I don't have a gambling addiction by any means. Um, I do it in a controlled manner. And if I'm to talk about gambling, I'm actually up uh, for the year. Uh, when I gamble, I, I do it very infrequently, I would say. Uh, maybe that month specifically was a little more than normal. Uh, but I don't gamble more than maybe 200 or $300 a month. Okay, but then it is, yeah, so it's 2100 this year so far that you've spent. Correct, yes, yes, yes. But I do have a little, uh, little chart that tabulates all of my losses and my profits, and I do believe I'm up by about 100%. Okay, so you are you made another two thousand dollars, roughly you. speaking. Yes. Okay, so for the rest of this year, we shouldn't see any other cash advances. To, I, I wouldn't confidently say that, um, uh, but I would say definitely, definitely not as much as what's already been processed towards Bet three six five year to date. Okay, so you have twenty nine thousand in your credit. So that was a that was one month. If I go to the if I go to May, it wasn't that bad. So sixty nine transactions, only a thousand dollars on food. A lot of it is Wendy's. You went to Tim Hortons 16 times. Mm -hmm. That sounds about right. Yeah, I, I, get a lot of, uh, I get a lot of morning teas from there. Okay, but sometimes three times a day. That fine. sounds about right. Yeah, that sounds about right. That's fine. So like my biggest thing here, I don't have, obviously you're a high earner and I don't want to tell you to save more because like your rent is low. You're spending a lot on cars. Uh, you are blowing a lot on food, which I'd rather, uh, wouldn't it make more sense? Let's say you spent $11,000 wouldn't you want 5,000 on food and then 5,000 on vacation? When you put it that way, yeah, 100%. Yeah, so like I, sure. didn't, I didn't know how to cook either. And then like, I know not everyone can do this. You do seem pretty busy, but I went to chef school and I learned how to cook on my own. I'm not the best cook, but I did learn. You can also learn on YouTube. It's not as time consuming if you meal prep, if you cook mm -hmm. on Sundays, a bunch of meals at once, it might be a little healthier as well. Because a lot of the things I see here are Wendy's. You went to Wendy's two days in a row. Guilty pleasure, I guess. Yeah, I know. And then, <laughs> and then Dairy Queen, and then Wing Market, and then Mr. Lube, 200 bucks? I had to do uh, emergency maintenance on my car. What and, happened? Uh, so I needed to do an oil change. I was way, after, uh, way past due um, uh, because I store my Mustang for the winter, uh, and Ford didn't have an available appointment for about two weeks. Wow. So wouldn't it be covered by your lease anyway? I'm guessing you lease. I do lease the car. Um, yeah, so I had coverage for, I believe, the first three oil changes, but I'm past that. Okay. And then everything else I see here would be like chat GBT, which is awesome. And then it just seems like business related. Not the biggest deal. You do spend a lot. So if I look at just the summary, sorry, I'm just going to flip to the last page. You spent 32000 in six months on your visa. And so if we annualize that, 62000 Mm-hmm. That's a lot. I know a lot of it is to start a business. Some of it does seem to be going on vacation and then Correct. a lot on food. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. could be managed, but you are a high earner. I'm not, and like you are saving and investing. So you, it looks like you have 200, 180,000 saved. 
So that sounds about right, yeah. With more than half of that um, in an investment fund. Yeah, and then would your income be growing from your business considering it's relatively new or what are you projecting? Uh, yes, definitely growing. Um, I believe we're projecting uh, revenue of another maybe a uh, quarter million for the remainder of the year. So wow. another 250,000 or so. Would you quit the full-time job and do this full-time? Yes, 100%. So I've actually already given my notice to my corporate job. Oh. Um, so it is a, a, a higher um, degree position. So because of that, I have to give notice in advance. Um, hence why I gave roughly eight months notice for them to find a suitable replacement. But uh, starting next year, I will be going full time on the business. Okay. So then your income would half in pretty much. Essentially, if we're looking at the figures today, it would half. But um, I do believe that with the way the business is growing and the more clientele that we're projected to receive, or to obtain rather uh, by the end of the year, I think it should cover some of the losses that I would, I would expect. Okay, so I don't mind. Like I'm trying to think of where to take this series and what to do. Like, do I give advice? I'm telling you to cut your spending. That's what everyone would say. I tell you to save more. That's what everyone would say. But like, I don't think you budget. I I don't think you should do a crazy budget. But if you do like a seventy thirty rule, so save thirty percent of your income and then spend seventy. Uh, some people do. 25% rent, 25% groceries and cars, but like that's too annoying and specific for me. Mm -hmm. Like if I were to recommend cut down on the restaurants a little bit, maybe learn how to cook, do some grocery shopping uh, three times a day, maybe twice at Wendy's is a little too much. Yeah, but fair enough. Fair yeah, enough. again, so like the way this series might go like in the future, like I'm not sure if I'll be just giving advice on people. It doesn't seem like you need help right now because you're high earner, you have your rent is low. Maybe if you do end up getting a mortgage, you'll probably need to double your down payment. So from 80,000, you might need 170. Okay. Um, and you have a realtor if you need any <laughs> help. So this is like a, <laughs> like a therapy session for me as well. But um, yeah, I think I'm going to end it here. Okay. I don't want to go too long. So I'm looking at the camera. We have 25 minutes. I don't want to go too long. Any other comments, questions, suggestions? Um, yeah, I mean, suggestions. I, I know a lot of people love passive income. Uh, I actually watched one of your first passive income videos um, and, and that kind of reinvigorated me in regards to allocating my resources or allocating my funds towards dividend investing. Um, I like the dividend investing approach. It's, it's a little more risk tolerant for my tastes. Um, and I do believe that uh, you can essentially account for the money that you're receiving on, on, a, monthly, on, a, on a monthly basis. Uh, versus growth stocks as an example or options trading uh, so me as a viewer my suggestion or my recommendation would be to just dive in a little more with the dividend approach uh, i know a lot of people love the passive income uh, aspect when it comes to investing how much do you make off dividends uh, right now on average i make about six hundred dollars a month off dividends awesome and you're dripping are you um, so I would actually like to ask you that question. I don't drip right now because I like to have the flexibility of, of uh, taking the money and putting it into a different stock. Um, just so I, sometimes I could hit the X dividend dates to get that, that income. Uh, do you recommend that as the correct approach or should I look to drip to save on investment fees? It's, it's a personal preference. I do like drip might be a little better, like over 30 years but if you want to invest in like different stocks like the one downside of drip is that you'll be too deep into one stock mm -hmm. like if you drip just on td for 30 years you might be too deep on td but there's no wrong way to do it you know over 30 years like i don't have the answers it's all personal preference because you're investing i'm not going to change the way you invest right now but 600 a month at 29 you know if you keep doing this like the snowball effect will hit in like the 15 20 year mark where you could potentially retire off dividends. And you said you didn't want to wait until 60. So what is your target age? Um, my target age, so I have two target ages rather. One of my target ages where I can uh, travel freely and work abroad is by the time I'm 40. Um, and my retirement uh, target age is 50. Okay, mine is 55. 55, fair enough. Yeah, I like it. Okay, I'm gonna end it here. Thanks for coming. Yeah, no worries, my pleasure. All right, bye guys. <laughs> cool.